Oh yeah, sure. I've got it on live stream right now, so uh, yeah, I mean it's not a problem to do so. Uh, just saying, doing some live stream. Checks here, people. In fact, let me turn this off. No, I was getting it on yet. So let's. Uh, is there a pocket on the inside by any chance, or is it all right there? I think that works out really good. Okay, we'll put this guy. And then Testing, one, two, three. Still just doing a little bit of uh, audio um, testing right now. Biodiversity it is such a richness. It will bring so much to the future generations. And the beauty of our seas and our lands. All of these are at stake because we're using them all up. We're destroying them.
very good evening to you all, and thank you for coming and joining you here at Elizabeth Seton. Uh, uh, through the visual, far away, you are all welcome. I'm Father John Zurich. I am the associate pastor here at Elizabeth Seton Catholic Church in Orland Hills. At this time, I'm going to uh, start with a brief prayer. Uh, it's one of those Catholic things that we just love to do, and if you would please pray with me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We are delighted, Father, that we have an opportunity before us to give you thanks and praise, to share in your love and mercy, to build the hearts of those around us, to turn you and go to you, to claim Jesus Christ, who loves us greatly. So we ask all things through his name, send your spirit upon us, Father, that we may do your will here on earth, and one day that we may see you face to face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Pinelli, our parishioner and host for this evening. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Um, I want to thank Father Zurich for the opening prayer and, uh, and also for the great leadership that he does with the social action ministry here. They do a lot of great works uh, on care for the poor. And also thank you to the uh, uh, members of the social action ministry who provided a lot of the goodies here that we'll be uh, sampling tonight. Uh, and please help yourself at any time. Uh, also, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Cardinal Joseph Bernadine School and uh, Father Bill Corcoran of St. Elizabeth Seton in Orland Hills uh, for hosting this event tonight, and also uh, to Michael Terrian and the uh, Creation Care Ministry of the Archdiocese of Chicago uh, for, uh, for co-sponsoring the event uh, this evening. Also, the Creation Care teams of uh, St. Stephen Deacon and Martyr and Our Lady of the Woods uh, here in the uh, Tinley Park, Pales Hills area for their support of the event this evening. Um, uh, welcome all of you that are in the audience tonight and all of you that are live streaming from wherever you are. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, I want to tell uh, you a little bit about our speaker uh, this evening, uh, Brother Mark Mackey. Uh, he was born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, after graduating from Cincinnati's Jesuit High School there, he did his undergraduate degree at uh, the University of the Miami of Ohio. He majored in zoology and environmental science there. And, uh, and while he was there, he published, uh, he published research on uh, ecology. Uh, he's, uh, he's continued his research at the graduate level at the University of Missouri and uh, uh, during graduate school, Mark rediscovered and deepened his Catholic faith and eventually left uh, academia to see where God was calling him, uh, which uh, ended up being the Society of Jesus. Uh, Mark uh, has taught grade school, high school, college-age students, but found his two summers spent in uh, rural northeast India to be uh, particularly formative. There he lived with and taught and learned from the indigenous Garo tribe. Uh, God has brought Mark full circle back to university. He's now teaching at uh, Loyola, Loyola's University uh, School of en Environmental Sustainability. Um, he teaches uh, general environmental sciences classes, science classes there, uh, but has recently created and teaches uh, a new course titled Eco-Spirituality for Action. Uh, Brother Mark is uh, optimistic by how much he's seen uh, environmental awareness grow in the Catholic Church in the last 10 years. And I can't think of a, a better background uh, for a speaker to have for tonight's uh, Laudato Si topic, which is the uh, intersection of spirituality and science. Please give a warm uh, round of welcome uh, for Brother Mackey. Thanks for the intro. Okay, thank you. 
much appreciate it. All right. Let's move away from that. Okay, is that better? Let's see where I can stand. How's that? Can you hear me? Great. Let's roll with this. This reminds me so much of hybrid teaching and learning that I spent uh, 20, 20 to 21 doing at a high school of all places. I went back into a high school. Uh, so learning to press the right buttons and turn things off. This is just part of teaching and uh, talking now, so no problem. Thank you, everybody, for the warm welcome. Uh, this is my first time out to St. Elizabeth Seton Parish. And Great to be warmly welcomed. I'm excited to get a chance to maybe mingle afterwards and to know some of the people here in person. And for those joining us online, feel free to reach out. If anything sparks your interest or any questions come up, uh, you can reach me via email. So excited to continue to talk about this topic that, like was mentioned in my intro, I've been really excited to see how much the Spirit's been moving through the church on the topic of care for creation. So just to extend that opening prayer, I just want to say a prayer right now of openness that we can remember that as we talk about this topic, and even when we're not explicitly talking about God, that we ask for God's guidance, for my words to be open to wherever God is guiding us as church. So let's move forward. Just a little roadmap of what we'll talk about uh, for the next hour or so before we get to some Q&A time. Just want to give you a little bit of my backstory, how I got into ecology and environmental science. A little bit about how, you know, I never left the church, but I did find my way back to kind of deepen my faith and engage my faith as an adult in the Catholic Church. So I'll talk about how that happened, kind of with the help of ecology, interestingly. I'll give you a little overview of, maybe you're kind of curious, what is environmental science exactly? And since that's one of the courses that I teach, I'll kind of cover some of the main points that an environmental science class covers and talk about what does Laudato Si tell us about these points? How does it enhance what a science class might teach us? Um, we'll look at how these ideas can go beyond ideas and go into action, see how they can be implemented. And then I'll give you a little example of a case study. Sometimes it's hard to, people can be really excited about care for creation, but it's not always clear how do we live this out? So I have a, what I think is an exciting example of how a community has lived out uh, some of these ideas. And then finally, we'll have a chance for Q&A. So I want to start with this photo. I have to explain to my college students that I wasn't like dressing up for a, a theme party or anything. This is how we dressed in the 90s. I don't know if you all remember that. But even my dad is just casually wearing his cutoffs. And I, I, I include this photo because it just reminds me of how blessed I am to have had a lot of influential experiences outdoors when I was growing up. And it ends up, that's critical. I can't tell you how many rooms of scientists I've been in where we kind of ask each other, like, hey, how did you become an ornithologist, a bird researcher? How did you become, into, how did you get into sustainability? And there's always these common stories, oftentimes from childhood, that people share, these kind of experiential encounters. And I have to thank my parents for that, for their kind of fostering this natural joy this uh, love of being outside that probably some of you have experienced yourselves and, and seen in young people that I think is kind of innate. If there's one maybe first take home tonight that you can think about for yourselves, how can we live out care for creation? I would say this, identify a young person in your life and see how you can help to foster their encounter out of doors. There's some surprising research that kind of shows how fewer and fewer kids are getting access to time outside. Uh, there's a great book that overviews this called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. He coined the term nature deficit disorder and kind of talks about psychological, spiritual, physical benefits of being outside as well as reasons like whether it's fear or cultural shifts that are just preventing our young people from even having these encounters. So be, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for my childhood. So that's one of the things I wanted to point up front. But when I think back on my childhood too, I get moments like this with my Nana and Papa and my dad again. My mom's always taking the photos. This was First Communion. And so I think too about those significant milestones in my life sacramentally in my parish context. And so part of what I'm going to be talking about tonight, you'll notice sometimes we'll be kind of approaching things from a, a nature-based or a scientific perspective. 
Other times we'll kind of shift back to the spiritual or faith base. And I think that that's how these conversations have to go. We can kind of find them woven throughout. Everybody able to hear me so far? Okay. And don't worry too much about text or photos. It's not necessary that you see them. I'll, some of them are just to remind me what to say in the first place. Or I'll point out anything that's necessary for you in the back. I, too, was part of a St. Elizabeth parish. I went to St. Andrew and St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish, a sister uh, parishes in Cincinnati, and this was done before this was, I think it's become more common, but it was an elementary school and a grade school. Um, are you all named after St. Elizabeth Ann Seton as well? I, I assume, figured we just tacked in the middle name. Um, but, yeah, that was, I can look back fondly on my first science teachers, Mrs. Pongonis, as well as uh, segueing into my high school teachers. And... It kind of just makes me realize that my K through 12 Catholic education was the beginning of my academic worldview. Anything that I've kind of done since then was laid on that foundation. Uh, not only the idea that I should be intellectually learning about things that I love like nature, but also starting to put into action like the environmental club. Like, if I do care for nature so much, what can I do socially? Uh, how can I meet with other like-minded people? So that was one of the first kind of contexts in my parish and parish grade school where I kind of learned to do this. This reminded me of a quote that I heard recently from uh, one of Chicago's own, uh, Bishop Barron, now an auxiliary bishop out in LA. And he talks a lot about the topic of science and religion. Has anybody here had a chance to hear from Bishop Barron? He has the Word on Fire Ministries. I think one of us was even taught by him, if I heard correctly, Father. There you go. So some personal experience. And well, just uh, maybe a couple months ago, I heard uh, in one of his new podcasts, which I recommend, I put the title up here, uh, it's called Science and Religion. He, he points out reasons why science and religion are not incompatible and how it's kind of tragic when people set it up as if the two are at odds or in competition. And one of the quotes he says is this. He says, first, in a very real sense, the modern physical sciences actually came from religion. By that he says, the great founders of science, like Kepler, Copernicus, Galileo, etc., were without exception trained in ecclesially sponsored schools and universities. In other words, they came from institutions that the church was running and, and purposely educating people in. That's where their thoughts and that's how they were able to contribute to science. So it's part of their own heritage. So even there, right off the bat, we can see there isn't this kind of competitive at odds. And in a small way, I won't compare myself to this lineup of distinguished people, but same for me. Same for your children who got their education from Catholic education and learned about science in that context. So things that I have done since then have been sponsored by that foundation of the church, learning to think. And I, I thank God every day that in the Catholic church, we lean on faith and reason, right? I'm sure you've met some Christian brethren who have been put in uncomfortable situations. I've encountered this a lot where they had to choose to maybe say it doesn't matter what you've been taught in science class, you have to believe that the earth is no more than 6,000 years, for example, or maybe it was created literally in seven days. And imagine what kind of a tough situation that puts a person into, right? I've had a lot of friends, and guess what decision they made when it came down to that. So thank God that that hasn't been the case in the Catholic Church in our lifetimes. But one thing I will say, I was remembering a story. Maybe, maybe you all encountered this with yourselves or your children, but I was a freshman in high school. And we had been assigned in our Old Testament class to read some passages, and I read about Noah's Ark, which I'd heard of plenty of times. But now that I was a big, bad freshman in high school, my brain was starting to think a little outside the box. And I'm reading, and I'm saying, okay, I know the story of Noah taking two by two the animals into the ark. But I had also known that I had watched a documentary recently on fungi and how many fungi there are and how they reproduce by spores. And there were lichens that grow on trees. And I learned a lot about the little critters you find in ponds. And I started thinking to myself, wait, did, did Noah bring two of all of those things onto the ark? It's like, and as I started to think it out, I was like, that just doesn't seem possible. But I know the story. And so I went to uh, the adult at the time. I went to my mom. And I said, I didn't give her any context. I just said, hey, mom, do we, like, did Noah's ark happen? Is that true? I could tell she was caught off guard, but she kind of collected herself, and she was like, maybe first of all, imagine how you would answer if a child came up to you and asked you that. I'm not, I'm not challenging, I think. I was just with my nieces and nephews all weekend, and they're always asking questions, and the parents are kind of put in a situation to have a quick answer, right? 
So this was a classic example. And my mom said, uh, yes, yes, we do. It's in the Bible. We believe this. And I kind of asked a couple more questions. She was firm. And I went away pretty dissatisfied. And I remember actually starting to think, almost like a depression, like, do I believe that? Am I, go am I going to? It, it was the first time I had to grapple with something like that. And I remember thinking, okay, like, is this, just, is this what faith means, to just have to believe this? And my mom came back to me about a half hour later, maybe 45 minutes, and she said, you know, Mark, I, I, you kind of caught me off guard earlier. I think she probably went and referenced some books really quickly. We didn't have quick Google searches then, but she kind of came back, and she said, you know, we don't believe that that was necessarily true in the scientific sense. She said, but it is an important, and there's a lot of truth in that story. She said, you can learn about the importance of the righteousness and faith of Noah, who God found favor upon, and Noah's family. You can learn about how that faith paid off in the midst of people ridiculing and um, just seeming ridiculous and still trusting in God's. So there was a number of truths to be taken from that. But thankfully, my mom didn't go hard on saying, we have to believe this was scientifically true. Maybe you've encountered a situation like this. I know there are a number of times where we have to recognize the truth in biblical stories and scriptures, but also discern when we're not exactly taking them literally true. And thankfully, as Catholics, we read scripture at up to seven different levels, right? And so um, that was an early lesson. This is probably seemingly insignificant to my mom, but that laid an important groundwork for me to be able to move forward, still be a person of faith, not discount Noah's story as just being silly, finding truth in it, but also not needing to be really drawing a hard line in the sand about there were two of everything, and that's how it worked. And that led me, it helped me move forward in my scientific career. You know, I had enough wise people in my life that said, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life, right? And so I said, yeah, okay, like, I, I love nature. I love being outside. So that's what prompted me to study zoology as a major, and I picked up environmental science, got to do some research early on, and I really got to kind of plunge into the scientific field, scientific research. My first uh, study was looking at how temperature impacts how well snakes can climb up things. And I remember my parents thinking, saying, like, oh, that's amazing, but also kind of thinking, and why does that matter? You know, but a good example of learning about science, scientific method, research data collection can seemingly be obscure things. But I actually had a friend call me the other day and say, I cited one of your old snake papers because I'm looking at how nests are getting preyed upon more often as temperatures increase by black rat snakes. And I was like, there you go. You never know. I moved on to a slightly more applied question. It was looking at this idea of all of the pesticides that we humans use for our lives. I had no idea how many, we literally spray millions of tons of chemicals and pesticides every year. And for good reason, to grow our food, to get rid of pests for our food. You and I benefit from this. Also, a lot of pesticides for uh, mosquito control. It saved a lot of human lives, but that also goes out into our environment. So I did, I got to be a, a tadpole shepherd for a summer in all of these artificial ponds and get to kind of do an experiment to look at how pesticide influence how amphibians grow. And this kind of work segued, segued me and I got to publish that and it segued me right into my graduate studies. I got to go down to the southern Appalachian Mountains where North Carolina and Georgia and South Carolina come together. Beautiful place, biodiversity hotspot, also favorite tourist destination. So there are a lot of country clubs. Within 20 mile radius of the small town I lived in, there were 20 different country clubs. So high density, right? And so we went in and asked the question, okay, what, what, is, the, what is the management of a golf course doing to our nearby ecosystems like streams, first of all? And second of all, are there ways that we can improve management to make better habitat, better quality? So once again, I found myself moving forward, getting to go out into the field. These are just some pretty pictures of some salamanders I was catching in those days and just looking at how, how golf courses are affecting those streams. And it was great. I was successful. I was publishing, going to conferences, teaching. Good stuff. But I did find in those days that despite the good stuff, despite the success of research and the movement forward at a young age with my science career, Something was missing for me. And admittedly, it's a longer story, but you know, I had kind of drifted away from being active in my faith, drifted away from the high school retreats and community that I had. And so faith wasn't at the forefront of my mind all the time. I was going to Mass on Sundays, but I wasn't really engaged. And I was doing good work. 
it was rewarding work to look at the problems of our environment and how we can improve that. But I still felt that if I really wanted to get at the depths of what was happening to our planet, beyond just treating the symptoms, there was a root cause that I just couldn't quite get to or teach about, at least at the public universities that I was at. And I didn't have words for this at the time, hindsight's 2020, but I came across this quote, I'll read it for you, that I think captures the sentiment I had as a young man in graduate school doing research. This scientist said this, he said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. And that kind of captured this idea that it's not just about having the facts. We've had the facts for a while now. Something else needs to happen. There's something internal that needs to happen. And really, scientists aren't the people that are set up to do that internal work and to help people through that. So that really kind of was a an unsettling feeling in the way that God uses unsettling in the good way to kind of keep us moving, right? And during that time, anybody here ever had experience with a Newman Center? Could I see a hand up if you've had? Yeah, I didn't even know about them, but it ends up Newman Centers are a way to bring a Catholic community to a public university. A great idea, right? And so here I was able to find a community where I could kind of address some of the questions I'd had about my faith, kind of clarify some things, maybe just kind of re-engage it. And so it was a beautiful moment in my personal journey. People often ask, like, how did you become a Jesuit? How did you have that call? And it's complicated, but ultimately, it comes from deepening my own faith in God, my own relationship with God, right? And it just kind of came as a natural consequence of that, just like all of our vocations, I think we could say. But this was one of the places I was able to do that in an important time in my life. And I remember one time, I was, I was going to Mass, and I saw in the bulletin, there was this call for proposals. They called it Newman Scholars, and you could write a research paper on some topic that you wanted to, which I had enough to do. But I saw you could write it on Catholic social teaching topics, maybe on liturgy. And I saw there was a chance to fill in or propose another one. And I had had this thing in my heart for a while, and I was like, you know what? This is a chance to look at what the Catholic Church teaches about the environment, treatment on the environment. And I didn't, I realized now that I had a fear around that topic. I was afraid that if I looked into the church's teaching on this, this thing that I kind of did as a living and it kept separate from my faith, I was a little bit nervous that I would end up finding the church's answer was lacking or either too simplistic or maybe dismissive. And I thought this might be the last straw for me personally and I might just have to let go this thing that was good for me as a kid. So it was kind of this pivotal moment. And I, but I was also a little bit nervous. Well, when I started into this topic, and this was in about, for reference, around 2009. And so it's amazing if you were to look up this today, you'd find so much more content. But in those days, I was directed to this book, Care for Creation, A Franciscan Spirituality of the Earth. And I found a lot of good content in there. I just found other um, broader topics, like the role of Catholic Catholic religious and non-religious in science. Major instrumental historical figures in science, like Matteo Ricci up there in the corner. And then I also found a pope within my lifetime talking specifically in an inspiring way that I agreed with about our obligation to care for creation, Pope John Paul II. And then finally, I also got to meet this guy, Father Patrick, and he was a Dominican, or he is a Dominican. He also has a PhD in chemistry and this brilliant man. And I'm gonna be honest with you, at that point in my life, I'm realizing I didn't think that a really smart person could be a person of faith, too. I thought you kind of had to check that. I, I've, I've learned a lot since then, but that was just kind of a misconception that I was living with. And thankfully, I had an example of this guy, this college professor, who was really smart, but was able to be a man of faith at the same time. It, it shook me up. I couldn't unthink him anymore. And that's one of the reasons I want to try to be a small example of that uh, for people today, too. So all of these things kind of opened me up to this world that was there. It already existed without my knowing about it. The church did care about and have teaching. They were both modern and ancient, too. People that were thinking about these topics hundreds of years ago. And so I just want to make this point that at that point, what basically happened is I was living a disintegrated life. I had my faith that was you know, needed to be bulked up, but I also had my career and this path in science that I saw as just being totally separate. I had kept them separate. 
And so what I find now is that my own call to my vocation, to a deepening of my faith, that happens to be in religious life as well, came through this interest and this call towards care for creation. It was through that. It wasn't peripheral. It wasn't something that once I knew God, he led me to that. It was something that God was already leading me on and was part of what led me back in my faith to kind of keep studying other aspects of my faith as well. And so I think we'll see this theme, we'll see this theme in Laudato Si about what seemingly can be two different topics are actually one and the same. They're part of the same. And that's a big message we'll hear repeatedly that Pope Francis really presses on. We may have thought in the past, they're framed it as social issues and then having separate environmental issues. And it ends up these things are part of the same. That's how our God creates. Sometimes from the human perspective, they can seem like they need to be kept in separate categories. Sometimes to our detriment. And this idea just of relationship, I think, is important. And I, you know, when I was in graduate school and I was studying for comps and everything, I was studying ecology. And this term gets used a lot. My mom sometimes uses ecology to be synonymous with, like, recycling or maybe uh, other topics. But here's, here's the definition of ecology, by the way. It's a scientific discipline that's the study of the relationship between living things with each other and with the non-living environment. That's what ecologists study. So it is plants and animals as well as soils and rocks and other things too. So it's all about how things are interconnected. We could say another definition of this is just it's the study of the internet interconnectedness of creation. That's what ecology is. And I was sitting in a, a young, I'm sorry, a teacher spirituality group and there was a, a teacher who's been teaching spirituality for a long time. I really hold him in high esteem. And he was one time sharing an, a definition of spirituality and just said, I think spirituality is about deepening our understanding of the interconnectedness of things in our interior lives. That's how God works. So I think there's this beautiful parallel between healthy spirituality and understanding of our own connectedness to God, to our neighbor, and to the planet. And ecology itself is the study of the interconnectedness of creation. It's relationship, just as our God, God's self, is Trinitarian relationship. So it makes sense that we can see uh, the same fingerprints of our God within the created works, right? So I think we see in general, maybe you'll hear this theme as I'm talking tonight, and hopefully you'll maybe sense some of these themes in your own understanding, from maybe a disintegration, thinking that things are separate, to actually realizing that sometimes the borders and the barriers we put up are just false. It's not really how God created. And you'll hear this term too, integral ecology, that root of integrating. That's what Pope Francis is calling us to. This method of, of moving into the things that you all have learned and studied together about ethics and morality and faith and love and justice and realizing that these same patterns are going to hold. Whether you're talking specifically about something environmental or something specific, some other aspect that we as church talk and work towards, right? And this idea of, of my own faith my own connection to the church, my own Catholic spirituality, it's, it, what allowed, it gave me space to kind of integrate and understand God's movement in my past while also giving me a path forward. And so maybe as we're continuing on tonight, you can think about this. What is it, what about understanding the way God created can deepen our faith, can deepen our understanding of ourselves as Catholic and our connection to God? Another question that I think is important is how can our Catholic heritage and mission, our Catholic faith, be helpful. What can, we, what can we bring to the table as Catholics in the, in the worldwide environmental movement? I think we can bring a lot. I think it's a big part of how we see the world and live in the world, right? I think we have a lot of gifts to bring to that. And then finally, we can think about how can we make this something that's internal? I don't want to go through tonight without mentioning that word, ecological conversion, which Pope Francis uses, and he quotes John Paul II, who first brought it up as this is something religious as well. It shouldn't just be an intellectual endeavor. It should be a thing that moves our hearts. And so maybe just to point out a couple ways where I've seen the spirituality that comes from our Catholic tradition be really helpful in my own growth and my understanding of our role on this planet is maybe just a healthy reminder that we are creatures. We are creatures. It sounds like an insult at first if you uh, get it out of context, but St. Ignatius was big on using this topic, reminding us that just the word creature insinuates a creator. We didn't make ourselves. That's kind of a spirituality 101 that I have to remind myself, as well as a lot of students and other people that I work with in a spiritual capacity. We didn't make ourselves. And that's liberating. 
right? But it also connects us to the rest of the world in our common home, the other creatures that God made. Ignatius says this quote, he's kind of referring to a spiritual director who's accompanying somebody else. He says, let God deal, let the creator deal immediately with the creature and the creature with their creator and Lord. Uh, maybe this sounds intuitive, but at Ignatius' day, people didn't necessarily think that they could have a direct experience of God or a relationship with God. It was usually intermediated. But now I think we can remember that um, this is the way that God chose to create. Another idea that I think we can bring to prayer and that we see in our spirituality is the fact that we are wonderfully made. Psalm 139, knit together in our mother's womb, right? You can't get more better understood than that in our creation. So we're part of this incredible story, and sometimes we need to sit back and remember that that's part of this amazing story that we're in. I don't know about you, but maybe you've read about the mental health of young people, increasing amounts of despair and depression. All of those have a common theme of people feeling isolated, cut off. They could be in the middle of a big family in school and still feel cut off, right? We know that phenomena can happen. And I think coming back to this sense of our, this role that we have, this place that we're in, and this radically interconnected creation can really help with that. So I think we'd be doing our young people a great service if this came at the forefront of how we think about our place in the world. And then here's, here's an idea that I think is pretty thoroughly Franciscan, and I applaud them for this. This idea that nature is the original place of God's revelation. Some Franciscans just pithily say, you know, nature is the first Bible. It's the first word of God. And if you think about it, that had to have been the case, right? How was God communicating with people before scriptures were written? Was God absent? No, I think we'd all agree God was there. God was still creating and sustaining and loving these people. And it's not only true in history. I think it's true within our own lives. I want you to think about when you were a little kid, before you could read, before you could ever sit still through a mass. I was probably 20 by the time that happened. But think about God was still loving you and, and actively in relationship, pursuing you, right? The hound of heaven. And so I think it's true that that's one of the ways, not the only way, but an important way in which God communicates with us, loves us, is through God's created work. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of places, uh, I think there's a lot of fruit for prayer. Here we go. Some points for prayer. Bring this kind of thing to your, to your prayer, I'd say. You could go to the Field Museum, an exhibit on the history of the universe, and I think you could bring that as a really beautiful prayer. Look at how our creator has created. It wasn't just in seven days. It was something radically more beautiful than that. And I think sometimes we don't allow ourselves to let our minds be blown in the beauty of how God made us. Also, just simple gratitude. Creature comforts, as we call them, right? Remember, we're creatures, so just... I think if we, if we just kept with the prayer of thank you for food, shelter, water, we'd be in a good place. And then finally, praying with our own stories. I bet you everybody has a special place in nature in their lives. I hope to God you do. Maybe you don't right now. Maybe it doesn't come to mind, but I bet at some point in your life you could think of a special place. So maybe call that place to mind some connection to nature that was important for just you personally. Maybe your spouse doesn't even know about it. And it's between you and God, right? And I love thinking about that and thinking about this quote from Let to See. Pope Francis says, The history of our friendship with God is always linked to particular places, which take on an intensely personal meaning. We all remember places, and revisiting these memories does us much good. So I think there is something beautiful to remember and to imagine, bring into our imagination that God was loving for us in those intimate, caring, peace-inspiring places that were part of our story. And then finally, maybe just a couple words uh, that you can, that I find fruitful for prayer. I think you could never tap these out of their kind of inspiration. Um, St. Ignatius in the spiritual exercises has us praying with this idea of not just a God who made things in the past or not just a God in our childhood, but a God who's actively loving us right now. He has us just simply pray with God dwelling in creatures, in the elements giving them existence, in plants giving them life, in the animals conferring upon them sensation, and in humans bestowing understanding on us. This is, an, that's, this is one of the things that praying with creation, I think, brings us this beautiful intimacy to our God. Not just the distant God who wound the clock and left. And not just 
dwelling, but also actively working and laboring for us. Can we believe, can we dare to believe that God is actively laboring for our good in creation? And I can tell you, the more I study nature, and the more I walk out in nature, it just makes this, my connection to God even deeper as I bring this to the forefront of my mind. And I kind of just include this because for some people, there can be confusion about, well, are we saying that, I mean, we don't believe as Catholics, and we do not believe that God is everything, right? That's what we call pantheism. There are some world religions that have that belief. In Catholicism, we, we believe panentheism. It's the way that we can say that we can find God in all things. God isn't all things, but we can find God's presence, um, God's handiwork in all things, too. So I just want to say, you know, a lot of these things and these inspirations were there in our Catholic tradition. And some of you probably knew about this well before I did. But I think we can also just stop and be appreciative of what a moment it was. Uh, for me, I first heard whisperings of this encyclical that Pope Francis was preparing. People had names for it, like, oh, this encyclical on nature or on the environment. Um, and now, seven years later, we can be grateful for what I would call this watershed encyclical. Which I think is, have you guys heard this term? Is this, I hope it's not a Cincinnati thing to say like a watershed moment. You know, it, it means it's like an important. And I, look, I hear the definition for you. This is the one I'm talking about. A, an event marking a unique or important historical change, of course, or one in which important develops, developments depend. So it's a watershed encyclical. But I also think it's funny because a watershed is a, is a term we use in environmental science. I used to teach sixth graders when I worked for the Archdiocese of Seattle, before I was a Jesuit, I worked with this Catholic camp where kids would come out in sixth grade and have this nature outdoor experience and learn how kind of ecological understanding matches up to our Catholic understanding. And I would ask students, I'd say, does anybody here live in a watershed? Does anybody here live in a watershed? And occasionally you'd, you'd see a kid might be bold and be like, well, my grandparents live near a river. And then the lesson would go on to explain what a watershed is, a geographical area where water kind of drains to. And what was your answer? We all live in a watershed. And that, that ends up being kind of the final answer. We all live in a watershed, so everybody should raise their hand. But I think it actually fits for this idea because I think that's what Pope Francis' encyclical is doing. When you learn that you live in a watershed, it doesn't change anything about reality, right? It's, that's how you've been living and that's how you've been sustained. Well, a lot of the things that Pope Francis points out in his encyclical they're not necessarily new, and maybe some scientists already knew a lot of this topic, but he's bringing a new perspective shift. He's bringing a new understanding and an awareness to something that has been part of how God created. But he's updating our understanding of this. So a true watershed moment. So I'm going to take a moment to step through some of the ways, that, the, the main topics that we hit on in an environmental science class, and I want to see how those relate to what Pope Francis brings us in Laudato Si. But I've been talking for a little bit. So maybe, anybody have any questions? I know we're not mic'd up, so I could repeat the question back. Does anybody have anything for me in, so far that's come up for you? I feel so distant from you all. Yeah. Sure, I'm, I'm sure we could make that available, make that possible. So yeah, we'll find a way where we can, the question is whether we could have the slides available again. Um, so yes. And this is being recorded as a video, so there'll also be a chance, that would be another way to kind of go back and, and see too. So. Sounds like they're interesting enough to write down, so that's a plus. Yeah, my students don't always do that, so this is great. Yes. I love that question. I've never gotten it before. The question was just pointing out that, you know, in Catholic culture, we have grottos, these beautiful outdoor spaces. Some people spend their whole lives kind of setting them up very deliberately. And I, I have not talked to any creator of a grotto. I've been to a few. I've prayed at a number. 
And I think that something that's beautiful about that is, I mean, one, it's just prayer in a natural setting. But to talk to the creator, like you said, would be amazing because each stone and each plant and things are, are really thought about, I'm sure. And I think that's just a beautiful analogy of God is the ultimate grotto creator, right? <laughs> Everything that we have on this planet was deliberately placed here from the mind of God in this kind of loving, intricate way. I would say a lesson behind everything, as Pope Francis says. I have a couple quotes that will point to this. So I love that as an example. I've never thought about that before. Um, it's, I think there's something to be said for wild nature, and then I think there's something to be said for very deliberate human manicured nature. I've grown in my love ever since the golf courses. I thought, okay, there can be some very heavily managed areas that can have their own natural beauty too. So thanks for that point. I want to be quick about this because, you know, you're not here for an environmental science uh, lesson. So don't be overwhelmed if I put a little speed to this. It'll just be for the sake of moving things along. But what I want us to think about is, yeah, people that are out there devoting their lives to, to the environment, here are some of the topics that we want to make sure we have a basic literacy of. We're not going to learn it all right now, but maybe this could be motivation for you to do a little searching. Find a podcast, find a documentary that might touch on some of these things. And to think about how does this relate specifically, how can it enhance our Catholic faith and what can our Catholic faith bring to enhance environmental efforts? I think that's good to think about both of those. Biodiversity is just the variety of life in all of its forms at all different scales. And we can talk about the benefits of biodiversity. I mean, just like an increased diversity in your stock portfolio can bring resilience and stability, there's something similar going on in nature. Um, we can have increased ecosystem productivity, increased services. There's a number of reasons that biodiversity is good, right? We can also talk about, unfortunately, the vast ways that human, human impacts are negatively hurting biodiversity. The way we manipulate the land, uh, the movement of invasives or non-native species, over-harvesting, climate change, all these different things. Well, I look back on my life, and this is kind of the entryway into my career as a scientist, was the love of, of biodiversity and nature. For me, it was loving reading about the Amazon rainforest. I knew exactly where the Amazon section of all the public libraries in Cincinnati were, because I would run over and just look at books of animals. I think there's something in kids, and some scientists have called this biophilia, where we just have this natural love of nature. So we should stoke that. And a lot of people I know that have devoted their lives to this um, came because just, they've loved them since they were little kids. This is a dusty old VHS tape that I used to watch at my uh, grandpa's house. So it doesn't take much. And I think even watching a documentary, all the good options that are on Netflix and other places can be a very prayerful act. And I think it can also just remind us of what an incredible creator we have. So don't discount those, those films that are out there. And my entryway was just this love of biodiversity. And unfortunately, the very species that I kind of devoted a lot of my research to are no exception. They continue to be some of the most threatened groups of species, too. So it's, I mean, I guess we can feel this sometimes in our, in our faith, too, that it's, it's both the love that drew me to this work, the love of nature, but it's that very love that breaks my heart when we see an abuse happening in the world, right? It's that very vulnerability that we have to open ourselves up to that can also just needs to touch our hearts about the state of the environment today. Pope Francis writes that, it's not enough to think of different species merely as potential resources to be exploited. We can't overlook the fact that they have value in themselves. Each year we see a disappearance of thousands of plants and animals that we will never know, which our children will never see because they have been lost forever. And the great majority become extinct for reasons related to human activity. So basically because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. And we have no such right. I think kids get this. Children understand this. Can we remember, remind ourselves as adults that we have no such right? Imagine tearing pages out of a library that's been gifted to us. This idea of intrinsic value is one that scientists hold to. Let's say I've met plenty of avowed atheist scientists who can still have this belief that there's something just intrinsically important about a species, an obscure salamander or a rare plant. And I think that's going to be a great place for us to communicate with people, to evangelize and say, what is it? What do you think is intrinsically valuable about this thing? 
And I think we have a lot of common ground as believers that the smallest thing is a gift from God. It has important, importance in itself. I think a lot of humans, a lot of young people see this, even if they don't necessarily connect it to a religious belief. And I think we can help people with that. Pope Francis says that it should disturb us to learn that the extinction of mammals and birds happen because they're more visible. But even the more obscure things like fungi, algae, worms, insects, reptiles, microorganisms, a lot of times these are um, less numerous, less seen, but equally important too. So that's another lesson that we have to understand that there can be things in this planet that just seem kind of, what's the role of that? What's the purpose of that? Well, talk to your local ecologist and they can maybe help remind you like, Everything has a place, not just because God made it, but also because you can't tug at a single thing in nature without finding it connected to everything else, as the famous John Muir quote goes. And then finally, I love this. I think it shows the potential of praying with nature. Pope Francis says, the universe unfolds in God who fills it completely. Hence, there's a mystical meaning to be found in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dewdrop, and in a poor person's face. Everything, anything. It doesn't have to be Yosemite or Yellowstone National Park. It can be the thing that you see out your window or the plant that's on your desk. That's how God created. There's transformative value in all of these things, and I think our prayer benefits from bringing this into our prayer lives. We can talk about things that are important, like water, and sometimes people are just reminded of, like, wow, yeah, even though we live on a blue planet, only 2.5% of all of the water on the planet is actually fresh water. Just a sobering reminder sometimes. And of that 2.5%, only, only an additional 2.5 is actually available uh, outside of ice and available outside of water that's in the ground. It's a very small amount of water. Water is a precious resource. I live right next to Lake Michigan, so it's easy to forget this. But the amount of water that we have, is, it's precious. It's precious, and it's so necessary for human life, right? and for other living things. One way of thinking about this, if all the world's water were stored in a five gallon jug, the amount of fresh water readily accessible would be less than one teaspoon. Whoa, right? Water's precious. I don't think about that often when I'm using it or when I'm discarding things that might affect it. And we can extend this. Don't, don't worry about seeing these graphics. I know it probably looks tiny, but same thing here, just extending to say, and what about access that humans have to fresh drinking water, and it's not equal across the world. Only 50% of people in sub-Saharan Africa have access to clean water versus 100% more or less in industrialized nations. And this one here, 87% in the Middle East, 76 in East Asia, 85 in South Asia, et cetera. So we know that not all humans have access, and not all humans, not to mention, are living like next to Lake Michigan. And we can just think about how this affects real living human beings on this planet. One in six humans, doesn't have access to something as basic as fresh drinking water. And it's usually children who are most affected by this. It's, it's the number one cause for the age, I think it's below the age of, um, I can't even read it up close, but it's like basically the, the youngest age range um, worldwide. It's the number one cause of death. Every 20 seconds a child dies from a waterborne disease. So even something like diarrhea in a lot of parts of the world can end up being fatal for children every 20 seconds. That doesn't touch my heart in the way that it should, but it's a reality that we're living on this planet, directly connecting people, especially poor and marginalized people, to our planet, to their health, to their basic human rights. I want to tell you something. I was humbled just a couple years ago. I'm, I'm on Loyola University's Sustainability Committee, and one of the things that came up was this water bottle ban. It had been in place for a while, and I was like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. We don't want extra plastic around campus, and the students have, have fought to have it banned from all of the vendors on campus, including the sports, right? Great. Well, it ends up that they didn't ban it because of the plastic water bottles like I thought. They banned it because they said, hey, this is in conflict with our Jesuit and our Catholic mission at Loyola to be in service of humanity through our faith and our justice. It's a basic fundamental right of humans to have access to water. And they said, we just can't believe in, in the monetization and the privatization of water. That was the reason that these students were kind of fired up about 
getting rid of plastic. I just thought it was the plastic part. I was schooled, I was educated and reminded by these students of the more kind of fundamental view and which motivated them to say, hey, this, let's just, we shouldn't be part of kind of a monopolization of water because every human should have equal access to water. I thought, okay. So I'm still learning things like that. But it was neat to see that that came from a Catholic faith, Catholic social teaching that motivated those students. And Pope Francis, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just tell you that he's basically saying that this affects the poor. Not everybody knew that. Not everybody was taking science classes. And the main thing that Pope Francis did is he told us our treatment of the environment is also treatment of other human beings, especially poor human beings. And in addition to that, I'd say he points out the beauty that it's our sacraments that connect us to nature in a special way. This is how God decided to create. And so he says, through our worship of God, we are invited, invited to embrace the world on a different plane. Water, oil, fire, and colors are taken in their symbolic power and incorporated into an act of praise. He reminds us that the hand that blesses is an instrument of God's love and a reflection of the closest of Jesus Christ who came to accompany us on the journey of life. So water poured over the body of a child in baptism is a sign of new life. The very baptism that Jesus himself went through by John was an act of water, through water. God chose to use this symbol. So it's not just this environmental or the social thing. It's also connected into the very way that God has deemed important in his creation, right? I'm going to humble myself a little bit here. Um, I had a lesson to learn that was my own version of an ecological conversion. And this happened around the topic of agriculture. Agriculture. So in case you haven't heard the term, Laudato Si movement defines ecological conversion as this transformation of our hearts and minds towards a greater love of God, each other, and creation. And it's a process of acknowledging our contribution, our own kind of complicitness, complicity, to the social and ecological crisis and acting in ways that nurture communion. It's a healing and renewing of our common home. So when I was in college, I, my best friends were, I was in Miami in rural Ohio. I had a good friend at UK, University of Kentucky, one over at IU in Indiana, one out at Ohio University. I loved to just kind of road trip around, hit the open road, get some wind in my hair, and, and kind of go out and visit my friends. And in those days, like now, I guess, I have a vow of poverty, I was, I was penny pinching. And you know what you do when you're driving and you need to eat dinner? You just go to the dollar menu, right? That's what I did. We, we called it the triple threat. We would get a double cheeseburger, McChicken sandwich, and a medium fries. Makes me feel old, but they used to be $3 for all three of those things. Can you imagine it? Um, yeah, and that was one of my favorite, easiest, cheapest meals to do, and it was delicious. Well, I was in college at that time, and it was actually in one of the environmental science classes that I was taking that a professor made this connection for me. He said, the number one cause of destruction in the Amazon rainforest, this place that I grew up loving and reading about, and I eventually have visited as an adult a couple times, the number one cause of destruction was for beef. It was for beef. Remember two years ago when the Amazon was burning and it finally kind of made the news, and if you read more about it, it's been burning for a long time, and it's not a wildfire, it's humans setting fire to the rainforest to clear it out? Because you can't raise cows in a jungle. You can raise them in a, a field that's been slashed and burned, right? And it also ends up that it came out that McDonald's was one of the big creating the big demand for beef that was clearing a lot of Amazon rainforest. And I learned about that, and it didn't totally infiltrate my brain. I, there was this resistance. I was like, but the, the, the double cheeseburger, those are delicious. They're so cheap, right? They're delicious. And I, I am humbled to say that I did not stop right away. Even though I finally made this connection, my immediate reaction wasn't to say, okay. It was well, wait a second, and it was trying to justify, and it was to try to get around it, and say, well, it's the only option I have. But for me, it eventually, the way, I, the way that I handled this in my own life is I just said, this is going to be an important decision. This, this decides the type of person that I want to be, right? Once I have this information, what am I going to do about it? Do I love this ecosystem or not? And it was, it was a struggle. It's, things like this still can be a struggle, but I, I engaged it. And ultimately, I had, to, I had to say, no, I mean, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to be complicit, but I was complicit. When I was giving money, even a dollar, it's me creating a demand. That's me being part of this. And I had to be real about that. 
And it was really tough. But that, for me, was an ecological conversion moment. Pope Francis says, a sober look at our world shows that the degree of human intervention, often in the service of business, interests, and consumerism, is actually making our Earth less rich and beautiful, ever more limited and gray, even as technological advances in consumer goods continued to abound limitlessly. And he says, we, think, we seem to think that we can substitute an irreplaceable and irretrievable beauty with something we have created ourselves. Pope Francis reminding us that it can be this lifestyle that we have, the convenience of it. Can we take a good, long, open look at that and be real about that? I'm not saying exactly what, what should come a result of that. That's going to be for you to kind of work out. But that's what I had to do. And what's crazy, I wish it were more simple than this, but now, even if you're trying to eat a, a non-dairy diet, like with soy milk, well, it ends up now it's soy plantations that are one of the big encroaching parts that are clearing out parts of the rainforest. So this takes this awareness. It takes doing your homework and kind of keeping up with this stuff. Because how would I ever know that when I went to the grocery store and got some, I don't know if silk is actually complicit or not in this, but if I just went and got almond milk or ate something that had soy in it, how am I going to know? It takes education. This is where the environmental education comes in. It's now a responsibility of us as human beings on this planet. We can't just claim ignorance. I mean, we can. But I think for us as believers, we know. We know. Can we do that? Can we bring this into our faith? Bring it to God. And, and that's what I have to do is to bring it to God as a struggle and say, I know I want to keep doing what's tastier, cheaper, easier. Can you help me with this? I believe, but help my unbelief, so to speak. And then finally, just this point of, I, I clumped together the topics of energy and climate change. And, uh, you know, NASA has a great website on this. There's a number of videos online that can help with some of the basic understanding. I think one of the best just simple phenomenon to understand is the greenhouse effect because it explains a lot of what's happening with our temperatures. I mean, maybe a reminder that the greenhouse effect is also why we have life on the planet. It's why we're here. It's a good thing. The Earth would be a lot colder if this phenomenon didn't exist and we wouldn't be here right now. But what's happening is it's the effect that's good for life on the planet is exacerbating and it's kind of increasing temperature more. And I think it's wild to think that the greenhouse effect was first described in 1859. I think sometimes it seems like a modern discovery, right? Or like something that's new knowledge. And it was actually in 1896 that the first scientists linked specifically that when we burn fossil fuels that it's contributing to this warming. So we, we, we can't claim that this is like new knowledge, right? And I think this we have to be honest about this is part of our human story, this kind of like the struggle, maybe this willful ignorance, at times legitimate ignorance. But now we know, just like college-age me wanting to just go through the drive through and just keep that lifestyle going. And it's kind of like, maybe, maybe that's not what I want to be a part of anymore. Maybe, maybe I'd like to see a change. And so if, if it seems like that the data is ambiguous, I, once again, I invite you, there's a lot, specifically if we just focus in on the amount of carbon dioxide, for example, we can just see that there's a consensus that we have a lot more carbon dioxide. This is going to affect the greenhouse gas. So I think the question becomes, how can we still harness energy? How can we still have human development and thriving? Good things. I mean, the Industrial Revolution often gets pointed as the reason we have increased carbon dioxide, because it's true, it's related to that, but a lot of good has come from that. So we as Catholics have to ask, how can we continue to have a developing and thriving of humans while also preserving the integrity of the future of our planet and future generations? Some would say this is a definition of what sustainability is, meeting current needs while also meeting the needs of future generations. Sustainability, 101. And so this begs a big question that the church, thank God, is now actively embracing. This question of, well, how can we be a positive part of this transition away from fossil fuels? Any fossil fuel we have is going to contribute to greenhouse gases. How can we get to a, a cleaner energy, a renewable energy? It's not going to happen overnight. That's why we use the word transition. But we now have a better understanding of how we can move forward. And the church is saying, we want to be leaders in this. We want to be part of the positive move forward rather than active resistance towards this. So that's a big question for us. And Pope Francis, I think these are wordier looking paragraphs, so let me just um, summarize. You can look them up later. He's basically saying, you know, there might be times when the world and the powers that be are not moving at the speed we want to, 
but it's up to us and we are capable of coming together ourselves as church, as groups, and making these choices, even if we don't maybe have to wait for governments who are dragging their feet. I was part of COP26 last year, and there was an eco-Jesuit and a Catholic delegation who said, we want to be at the table. We want to be part of saying we're still here and we care, and we want to know how can we mobilize our people, motivated by our faith, to be an active, positive part of this transition. And sometimes there'll be corruption, there'll be public pressure. But unless citizens control, unless we come together and use local legislation, and unless we build these agreements, then we're just going to be stuck in the place saying, well, I guess we'll wait. We'll wait for somebody else. We'll wait for the green light. And what Pope Francis is saying is, as church, bottom up and top down, let's do this together. So what's it going to look like to band together in the communities that we already have, caring for the creation that we've been giving to move forward. So finally, I'll just, I'll end with this before our Q&A, is, you know, students will often ask, well, what, what can we do? After a semester of this, of learning about what's happening in our environment and all the little things, they ask, well, okay, but we want that quick and easy answer, which, by the way, it's usually not a quick and easy answer, right? So let's just name that. But at an individual level, the answer I would say is kind of boils down to three things. The first one is you can vote with your wallet, which means be conscious about what you're purchasing. Every time you purchase something, a double cheeseburger, a meal, um, a product, a car, anything else, just bring some awareness to that. Maybe that takes taking an extra five minutes to do a little online searching about that product. That can go a long way. Similarly, is actually voting with your ballot, too, using your voting voice at all the different levels that that happens. Is, that's one of the ways it's important. And as Catholics, just like our Catholic conscience and our Catholic worldview and understanding and faith in the church should motivate our voting on many different ways, this should be one of them. This should be included. Not the only thing, but it should be included in the mix of how we think about what our leaders should value. And then finally... I'll leave you with this. It, it might sound, I don't know, I'll, I'll let you make your own judgment to it, but despite all of these different, uh, the practical things that we can do, I really think it's important to just continue for you to, go, to cultivate your own personal relationship with creation, with God, through God's creation. And I leave you with this poem by uh, Pedro Rupe, one of the Jesuit uh, leaders of the past. He said, nothing is more practical than finding God, and that is than falling in love in a quite absolute and final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of your bed in the morning, what you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, what you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. So fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. And the beauty of this is, if you first fall in love with God, just as I hope you're doing right here at St. Elizabeth Seton or wherever your parish, wherever your place of worship is, I hope you're every day working on continuing to fall in love with God. That should be number one. But what I've found is if you're genuinely doing that, you will care about what God cares about. You will care about other human beings that God has made, and you will care about God's creation. I think it will naturally flow from that. So I leave you with that, and I appreciate your time and attention. I look forward to hearing some uh, questions. And before we get into the Q&A, Andy has some, um, some words to share with you, too, and uh, some inspiration about what, what can look, Care for Creation look like right here at this parish. Thank you, Brother Mackey. Boy, that was powerful. And uh, thank you for your, uh, your insights on your own personal eco-conversion. And it sounds like there was a few of them that were most excellent, and, uh, uh, and also for explaining uh, ecological conversion to us and the importance of an integral ecology, and all of the, you hit so many wonderful points, and Laudato Si is such a rich document. If you, if you haven't read it yet, it's a very transformative document, and reading it in and of itself can trigger, trigger an eco-conversion. But uh, let, me, uh, let me just say we're going to hold questions for a couple of minutes, and, uh, and I want to share with you a case study uh, that uh, we did here at St. Elizabeth Seton 
Um, and uh, I appreciate uh, Brother Mark uh, inviting us to, to share that with you. Um, as, uh, as he mentioned, uh, climate change is a very important uh, topic in, uh, in Laudato Si and uh, an important topic that is uh, suggested that we uh, pay a lot of attention to. And uh, there was, uh, before COVID, there was, um, there was quite a bit of activity in the Catholic Church, uh, really good activity that uh, enabled us to, uh, it enabled us to uh, get messaging from the church. Um, like there was the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, came out with a welcoming statement um, for uh, carbon pricing legislation that was called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Um, it was bipartisan legislation that was introduced at the time. Pope Francis had come out and uh, issued uh, a statement of support for carbon pricing as something that was potentially important uh, as a tool to fight climate change. And then our own uh, Cardinal Supic uh, had uh, also came out with a, uh, a statement in support of that very same le legislation that the U.S. Uh, bishops did. So St. Elizabeth Seton picked up on that. Uh, the momentum that was generated. And, and we, as parishioners, generated 500 letters to uh, Congress in support of that legislation. And we combined that with another 400 letters from around the Chicago area. And I was on the team that, uh, that went to Washington, D.C. and presented those to the senators. And I will tell you that Senator Durbin's office was visibly moved by that. And I don't think it was a coincidence that four months later, uh, Senator Durbin, after we generated all of these letters uh, from the parish and from around the uh, archdiocese, that, uh, that we uh, had a, uh, a bill that was introduced by Senator Durbin on carbon pricing. And he really hadn't mentioned much about carbon pricing uh, prior to this. So we, we, were in, we were very encouraged by the power that those types of actions have. Now, getting a bill introduced is just the beginning of it. Uh, we need to stay on it till we have uh, legislative solutions. There's only so much we as individuals can do, but uh, we, we need legislative solutions as well. So I want to share with you a comment on this subject by one of the heroes of, uh, of creation care, uh, one uh, Bishop McElroy, who is the bishop of uh, San Diego. I'm just going to uh, set my mic over here on the uh, uh, and and play this. We cannot be passive in this fight because it is the fight for the whole future of humanity. All of the beauties of our world, the biodiversity. It is such a richness that will bring so much to the future generations and the beauty of our seas and our lands. All of these are at stake because we're using them all up. We're destroying them. We are undermining the very foundations of this great, beautiful world that God has given to us as gifts and that we will be handing on to our children and grandchildren as a tarnished gift, as a gift which is only a shadow of what we have received. So please, speak with your legislators. Form groups to educate your communities about these issues. And know that as you do so, this is an action of faith. This is an action of the gospel. It is an action to which God calls you at this very moment. Bishop McElroy, powerful stuff. So, we want to invite the audience tonight to be advocates. 
Um, there was great news at the beginning of, um, of this year when the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops uh, issued an action alert uh, for the faithful to, uh, to write letters to their congressional representatives, uh, and especially senators, and asked them to support climate provisions that were included in the Build Back Better legislation that was being proposed last fall. So tonight we extend to you an invitation to write a letter. Uh, we, uh, we could, we'll pass some letters around. You can use the language that's on the letter, or you can write your own letter if the spirit moves you. And, uh, and we'll see to it that those letters uh, uh, get to our, our senators on that. Um, so if you could pass the letters around and uh, to the tables. And uh, for those of you that are streaming, uh, there's an opportunity for you as well. If you go to godsplanet.us slash advocacy, it's the same advoca advocacy message. You just scroll down to the uh, action uh, campaign alert and then click on the send message now. Uh, a significant part of Laudato Si challenges us to address the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. And if we don't address the cry of the earth, it just makes our job uh, for uh, addressing the cry of the poor all that much harder. So um, thanks for giving this advocacy action some consideration before you leave. And uh, now let's go back to Q&A and uh, uh, please uh, uh, give whatever questions you have to uh, Brother Mackey. And uh, if you could just repeat the questions. Sure, I'll repeat them back so everybody can hear them. All right, so we're back on. Uh, and just a chance for maybe clarification or questions or anything that comes to mind as you've been patiently listening uh, to my talk tonight. Yes. Yeah, I can repeat back the question. The question is, working at a university like I do, and we have students coming in from high schools that are both Catholic and religious as well as secular, are they prepared? Are they prepared to engage the contents of Laudato Si? And, uh, you know, I'd say that I'm impressed that our students are prepared because it's not just something they're getting from the classroom. It's part of their generation and their generation's identity to care about the environment. Sometimes the negative side of that is just like anything that you kind of go along with. There might not be a lot of depth to understanding, but I've repeatedly encountered students that have a lot of depth to their passion about caring for the planet and the state of the planet right now. And I'd say that's, I've seen that equally from, from Catholic high schools as well as non-Catholic high schools. Um, what I would say, though, is that a lot of those students are most likely getting this from just the environmental and the social justice aspect. And I think that that's a good thing. I think that that's a flame that, that God has helped to stoke through love, for sure. But what I see missing from both Catholic and non-Catholic students a lot of times is the faith component, the, the taking the time to see how this would fit into um, our broader role as humans on this planet created. I think a lot of times it's just seen as a problem to fix, which at one level it is, but I personally find it missing a major point if it's only a problem to fix. And it isn't also helping us understand who we are and who God is and the task that's been given to us as well. Um, but I've found faithful Catholics come in who have been well taught from their parishes and from their youth groups that just don't have a lot of, of depth on the environmental science side, let's say. So... In general, I'm impressed with the generation and their willingness to say, like, this is important to us. This should be at the table. This should be in conversations. But I think there's a lot of uh, everybody could use some more roots, myself included, into understanding, like, the depth of this issue, too. Yeah. Yes? Yeah.
Great question. So we have a high school teacher here who teaches Catholic social teaching in the classroom and is asking, how do we bring this topic up, continue to call it important, without it immediately becoming politicized and often as a consequence just being tossed out or disregarded or maybe eyes rolled or, oh, I know what you're going to say and this is an agenda, right? Yeah, it's a great question. That is a great question. One thing I'll say, I don't think this is the only answer, but let me start here. People I know who love nature, love camping and hiking and fishing and hunting, regardless of their political affiliation, are able to hear the message and know that it's true, know that our water quality is being affected and know that the amount of forest that they've seen over their lifetime has shifted. And so they can't immediately discount this as just something that uh, as a political agenda. They've kind of experienced it. It's been part of their life. And so in some way that indicates that um, you know, getting back to that experiential, that encounter, making this part of people's lives, and then they'll be able to already kind of be able to navigate that, even if they do have strong political beliefs and it feels like it's part of another party's platform, they can still hear it and say, yeah, I agree with you. You know, our other classes should be like in theology and philosophy or when that comes up in our high school classes. I hope one of the things that comes up, in addition to critical thinking, which I think would help, address this issue and getting our young people to think for themselves. I think trying to teach non-dichotomous thinking is critical. Non-dichotomous thinking. It's, it, our society is big on either or thinking. It's this or it's that. That's just kind of how our conversations and sometimes classrooms exist. And I think good Catholic teachings, I've always been told it's the Catholic both and I think that that really kind of helps break down. Now, I know that's a big, that's a, it's also kind of an entrenched thing, but I think if we had more of that, what we're seeing is a symptom of a lack of this. It's part of the division that people talk about in America. And so recognizing those aspects would also kind of be um, holistic fixes that would help get at what you're seeing every day in your students. Um, and then the other thing is just dialogue. When I was teaching at that, that high school last year, um, yeah. Every time we brought up a new topic, whether it was caring for creation, whether it was walking with the excluded, um, any other thing I can think of, we would have some families that would kind of call in and be upset about it. So I guess that sounds like Jesus in the Gospels, if you ask me, right? We can trust Jesus, and we can trust Jesus' mission, and we can see that he often was dismissed kind of like from the day's political regions, kind of out of hand. And so I guess it's kind of pointing back to those Gospels and, and teaching with conviction. And maybe they can just see from our witness that, hey, this isn't a, some teachers do have political agendas. I've encountered that as well. So I think they, when they see genuine authenticity, I think students who are pretty perceptive can kind of see that. So I hope that helps a little bit. But thanks for your work. That's, uh, that's invaluable and I'm sure frustrating on a daily basis too. <laughs> Those are good questions. Anybody? Yes. Yeah, thanks for the question. The question being, um, in my work, especially at the university, do I see young people kind of being open to actually putting things into action, walking that walk, kind of, yeah, and I think, if anything, they hold me accountable to make sure it's not just about talk, right, to kind of, to get to those action points. All right, how does this turn into action? And I was a little nervous teaching my eco-spirituality for action class, because I thought, I'm going to get grilled if it, this only seems like esoteric ideas. Or, like, I know that the students that are that registered for that class want to have action too. And what I found is that with deliberate building and creating the syllabus in the course, we're able to do that. We're able to say, you know, in, 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 our, in the Jesuit order, we, and we're not the only one that have this, but we have this a phrase of being contemplatives in action. And I just, that was a big draw to the Jesuits for me. I was drawn to being a contemplative. I, I would have loved to have been like Thomas Merton down in Gethsemane in Kentucky, but I went to some Trappist monasteries, and I realized that's good for a long weekend, but um, I felt a call to the action part as well, and the necessity of that in environmental work. And so I think, yes, sometimes the students, to your question, I think are more tipping on the scales towards action, 
And I think a lot of times there needs to be, once again, back to like creating a depth to this. We need to see like, why? What, what is the motivation behind this action? Because there are other people where they just see people moving and doing something and they just kind of want to jump in on it, maybe be contrarian to whatever it is. I think, but, but seeing students organized, I've been part of kind of climate marches and things where I think students are open to it. They're more proactive than me or my generation was. And I think when it does happen, it helps to combat the depression that a lot of students are feeling as well. Uh, a big theme has been what people call eco-anxiety or eco-despair. Especially students I know that are majoring in this stuff and every day they're learning really depressing facts. And it can kind of spiral people into a dark place. But whenever there's action, I think that that brings this balm, this kind of hope, and this kind of sense of, well, there's, there's still a hope where two or more are gathered, you know. And so I see a propensity to action. Sometimes I think a little more contemplation can come into it, but the action part's there. Yes? Thanks for the comment and the question. And the question being, you know, what about the parents of those students, high schoolers, college age students? Um, and oftentimes maybe noticing that there isn't the kind of action we would expect or want to see. Yeah, I'll, I will lament that along with you because I guess on the positive side is when parents are just going to be supportive. Maybe drive a kid to a, a creek cleanup or to be, and I've seen a lot of that support, whether they're care or not, at least they're getting the kid there. And that's a great thing that parents can do, right? But we have to remember, too, with the witness value. And thank God students will still maybe go out and continue to act even if they're not getting that exact witness or, or support vocally from their parents. But what a gift it would be to have that as part of the picture, too, to have a student who cares and has a community and is also hearing their parent say, yeah, yeah, like this is good. I'm proud of you and I want to be out there in the creek with you. Just like one of the reasons that children are having less exposure to nature, like that book, uh, Nature Deficit, The Last Child in the Woods, it takes a mentor to take a child out in the woods. You need an adult to get out there. But what I've noticed too is you don't need to be able to name the bird that your kid asks you about, and you don't have to get into the creek and catch frogs as well. You can just take them there, and that's really important, that support. But I think if you were to show that support, but also say, hey, I need to learn about this as well. I think that's one of the things that's missing too. And I think that would be a great lesson that transcends environmental things, to just have an adult say, yeah, this is new to me. Let's learn together. And so I don't see that happening a whole lot, but I think there'd be a lot of opportunity for that. And I could imagine that that would be um, the sort of thing that God and the Holy Spirit would work with um, but I will say, I was reading an article a couple weeks ago about, it was basically titled, like, Moms Who Are Helping to Fight Climate Despair. And it was some moms that had noticed the despair in their children, and, then, and a couple of them had degrees and science degrees, and they banded together in their own kind of network to say, no, like, we're here for our kids just like moms always are, and this is no exception. And so it was kind of really neat to see that rallying, as only moms can do. And they were able to take their kids along, too. So... I hear what you're saying, and I say there's a lot of room for improvement on that. But, uh, you know, and maybe it takes a little bit of humility, but I think we're called to be lifelong learners, too, so that could be, yeah. Thanks for that. Yes.
Yeah, thanks. Man can't really make that much destruction. It's arrogant to think so, and that God is in control. So who are we to make it seem like we're the center of the universe, that kind of thing. And this is coming from a believer, probably went to a big, like a non-denominational kind of church, but a, a Christian. Yeah, it's an interesting thing that we're going to have different perspectives from other believers. I'm increasingly happy the way our church is coming out on this topic, even if it took us a while to get there. I feel like I can trust the content and the approach that we have and the way it's informed by our faith and tradition. You know, it's tough. I appreciate what you said in your example. You shared that you kind of let this person who came, came to you and was saying these things in the conversation, you kind of let you were listening. And I think a lot of times that's a key, is to be an active listener without immediate dismissal. Showed that person that you weren't just forget about you, you know. And sometimes that occurs. It, it happened less frequently, but it's, we all know it's common that there can be climate change deniers who just won't hear it and will just say, no, you can't prove that. And I think what you notice, like you seem like you intuited, you're not going to be able to change that person's mind, right? So I think first of all, it's just recognizing, are you in a legitimate conversation or situation where a person's open, or are they just going to kind of be spouting. And so at that point, I think I would agree with you in that that's just not the place to... But, but I would say that there's some pretty obvious data. And if somebody doesn't like, like NASA graphs, there's some interesting data about, like, um, I wish I had them on hand, but the amount of biomass or just sheer volume of animals on the planet are just dwarfed by our cattle, pigs, cows, goats, and chickens. I mean, it's like... <laughs> It, it's like several times more than all of the birds and mammals and animals kind of combined. It's just kind of more obvious that we have a, a huge impact. I mean, one of the images that I find really helpful for people that may be skeptics is if you just go on Google Earth and zoom out, you can just look at photos of the lights on planet Earth. I mean, it's just pretty obvious that we we really have a dominating presence on the planet. And, it, you know, at this point, yeah, so I would kind of, be skeptical that I'd be able to change somebody's mind on that. But that being said, there's a lot of good data that would kind of quickly say, like, here, it's right here. On the God side, on this point that, well, God's in control, yeah, that can be a tough one to argue. And I think, it, I think every believer here recognizes that's a struggle that we should be having within us, this question, just like the role of death, just like the role of war, tragedies. I mean, it's part of being a believer is not having certainty. And, and I think any good Catholic recognizes uh, that it's not really an acceptable answer to just say, it's all in God's hands. Um, we're made for the next world, and that's it, right? That's not, that's not our belief. So this just chalks right under a long tradition of not saying, we're made for the next world, and let's just wait it out. It's part of saying we're called to be God's hands and feet. God decided to create in such a way that we are co-creators and co-laborers with God. It's not for us to say why or how, like why that is, but that's how God created. And so I'm, I'm glad that our church, even if there were periods where we could say it, it took a while or whatever, I'll just focus on the fact that we're moving. We're saying that it matters. It's affecting the poor. It's affecting the marginalized. It's affecting people's lives, children's, adults, all walks of life. And so that means as Christian disciples, it's our business now too. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, God said, let us make them in our image. Let's give them dominion over the fishes in the sea and the birds of the air. Yeah, it's true. And I think as Pope Francis addresses this, I was so happy to see specifically in Laudato Si. And he says, he kind of says, you know, Christians have misinterpreted this. He did not say that the Bible got it wrong or Scripture got it wrong, but he says that we have taken too much liberation with, with liberty with how we interpret that. I did, a, I did one of these, uh, we call it an exegesis paper, where you write like 20 pages on two lines in Scripture, and I did it on this exact passage, actually. So I got to do a deep dive. And I can just tell you what I remember from that is God, after making humans in God's image and likeness, the Mago Dei, the stamp of, of God that sets us apart from the rest of what he created, he says, let's give humans dominion over the other things. And, and the insinuation is to give 
humans' dominion in the way that God has dominion, to act in the way that God acts as creator and ruler. And so part of it is seeing, does it look like like have lordship over, use as you want, is that how God the creator works? And the answer is, is no, I think, with an honest look at it. And so ultimately, yes, we were given this stewardship, and there are different transi- translations of the word, but let's just stick with dominion. It's saying have dominion in the way that God as ruler and king has dominion. And does that look like the way that we're having dominion over, over the earth? And I think a lot of people are saying, no, we didn't. <laughs> We didn't, and what that indicates too, I think, is first of all, understanding who God is. It's always a good first step. And when we know that God is an encounter, is love, is self-giving, then that should be the way, this generative way that we interact with nature rather than just, oh, we're kings, you know, we can use this, right? So no, I think there's a lot there, and you, you got it exactly right, that line in Genesis that really touches on this topic. Um, but as Pope Francis says, we can no longer use this in such a way to say, we can do it whatever we want. And, and some of that just goes to, I doubt it was just misinterpretation. I think it was maybe willful misinterpretation might be a way to put that. Yeah, thanks for that. All right, I think we're at time, so I'm looking forward to seeing some of you over this amazing uh, dessert and snack table over there. And uh, thanks, everybody. If you're still with us online, we appreciate your time and attention. Thank you, Brother Mackey. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, and tonight uh, we have uh, just a, a closing couple of moments f- with uh, Tony Quintanilla from the Archdiocese of Chicago working with the uh, Encyclical Working Group and the Laudato Si Action Platform. Uh, action is a great antidote for anxiety. So I think you'll be interested to hear what uh, Tony has to say about the Laudato Si Action Plan, or Action Platform, excuse me. Thank you, Andy, and um, thank you, Father, uh, brother. Um, Yes, uh, so Chicago is one of the um, archdioceses that's really engaged with the Laudato Si Action Platform. Uh, As probably most of you know, uh, the Pope initiated the Dada Sea Action Platform uh, World Day of the Poor, November 14th, uh, 2021. And uh, what it is, it's an online tool to help um, Catholics and all people of goodwill to practice the principles of Laudato Sea, to understand the goals of Laudato Sea better, the themes of it better, and how we can actually uh, put it into practice by thinking about our faith, engaging with our faith, and uh, looking at all the goals of uh, Laudato Si, including, as Andy and a brother have said over and over again, the care for the earth and the care for the poor, those two key links. So I um, encourage you to take a quick look at the display here, and if you're interested in learning more, uh, there's a website uh, at the Archdiocese of Chicago uh, website, archchicago.org slash creation will take you to the page for the Care for Creation Ministry. And um, there are many parishes now that are actively engaged in the Laudato Si Action Platform, including your own parish here. If you want to learn more about that, Andy certainly is a resource. Uh, if you're not from this parish, I uh, welcome you to talk to me or put your name down on the mailing list sheet there and we can be in touch with you and uh, get more information to you about how to get uh, involved in that. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for everybody coming out tonight. Uh, Those that are here, please uh, please, uh, stick around uh, and and visit with us. And those who have uh, live streamed in, Thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening, and uh, thank you again, Brother Mackey, for making the trip in and uh, giving us some great illumination on uh, Laudato Si. Thanks, everybody. (laughs) 